Well, Jerry Thorpe, who was the producer and director and really developer of the series, uh, had seen me on Broadway playing uh, the Emperor of the Incas in a play by Peter Schaffer called uh, The Royal Hunt of the Sun. And like everybody else who saw that play, he was just knocked out by my performance and I guess my, uh, what, uh, you know, the image of me just stayed in his head. Almost every good part that I've gotten in the industry has been from somebody who was in that audience. And so he sent the script to me. And I had just finished uh, doing a picture uh, in Arkansas, uh, which was Martin Scorsese's first 35 millimeter movie it's called Boxcar Bertha. And in that picture, uh, I aged, oh, 15 or 20 years. And I also was supposed to have been in prison and been beaten up by guards a lot. So for the last sequence, which we fortunately shot last, uh, I thinned my hair out. At the end of the movie, my hair just looked awful. So I thought, you know, why don't I just start fresh? So I shaved my head. And when I got back to Los Angeles, this script was uh, sitting on my desk, so to speak. And so when I went into the interview, I had a shaved head. Uh, actually, I had a shaved head that had grown out for a week or two. So obviously I hadn't shaved it for the part. Um, and I think that had something to do with it. But I think really, maybe from the moment he read the script that Jerry Thorpe pretty much had me in mind for the part. And when I read the script, I said, well, this part is perfect for me. There's, there's no way I can avoid doing it. I have to do it. And I was told by my manager, he said, there's one hitch, and that is that there's a serious contract attached to doing this movie. And I know you don't want to do a series. And I said, no, I sure don't. But he said, well, read it anyway. And I read it, and I thought, you know, this story about a half Chinese Shaolin monk walking through the Old West, there's no way this could be a television series anyway. It's going to be a great movie, but it's not even remotely possible that they'd make a series out of it. So I figured I'd take the chance. And we all know that's not the way it worked out. I remember they asked me, uh, what are you going to do about the martial arts? And I said, well, uh, don't we have stuntmen? We hadn't figured out yet that you really can't do these movies with stuntmen, that people really want to want to know that you're really doing it. But I said, anyway, you know, I'm pretty much of an athlete. I've done a lot of fights on movies, and I'm a fencer and a dancer and, and a gymnast, almost an acrobat. And just for emphasis, as I was leaving the place, I did a flying I guess it was a sidekick, but I used to be able to jump really high. I guess I still can. But I kicked the top of the door, above the door, actually, on the wall, and I left a bare footprint. And then I went on out the door, and that bare footprint stayed there for the entire four years that we were doing the series. And I can imagine them just sitting and looking at that footprint and going, you know, this might be the guy. I was doing a thing at CBS, uh, kind of a big thing, where they, uh, they do it like a play. Um, and it's a two-hour movie. And uh, you do a lot of rehearsal, and then you shoot it all in two or three days as though it was a play. And it was uh, produced by David Suskind who I had known from New York. He was one of the producers, actually, the Royal Hunt of the Sun. And his brother, Murray Suskind, stopped me in the hall while we were having a cup of coffee, and he said, you know, if, if you were going to do a series, what would it be about? I said, I don't want to do a series. And he said, well, yeah, but if you were, what would it be about? And I said, well, it would be about Cain, the first murderer, walking through the land of Nod to the east of Eden with the mark of God on him and trying to atone for having killed his brother. And I'd set it in the Old West. 
And he said, I'm talking about a commercial television series. And I said, so am I. And he just shook his head and walked away. And then five years later, four or five years later, here comes the script. So I'd say, in a way, I must have had a lot to do with the character, because um, it was my dream. Uh, and then as we were shooting the thing, I remember a few times when there was a question that would come up, and Jerry Thorpe or someone else would say to whoever asked the question, he said, well, David actually knows more about this character than anybody, so you better ask him. Um, because I, I guess I took the ball and ran with it. And you know, all the people at, at Warner Brothers, including myself, really knew very little about martial arts or Chinese philosophy. We had to study, we did a lot of research. We were constantly listening and looking for information, how to make it more truthful and how to make it uh, more effective and make it a better learning experience. We, that was all very important to us. And I was definitely one of the leaders in that. The flute came in, I guess you could call it by accident, but, um, you know, are there really any accidents? Um, there was a, a fellow named Michael Green who played uh, one of the guest star roles on the series, and he made bamboo flutes, so he gave me one. And, uh, and I took and fastened a, a thong to it and hung it on my shoulder and thought it would be cool to carry it around, because I knew that masters do tend to play a musical instrument. Uh, you know, they, they practice calligraphy or they paint or they, they do something artistic. It's part of the balance, part of the mix. And, uh, and then uh, a little while later, I think he gave me another one, and, and I gave away the first one and carried the second one, which is a little larger. And, I think I must have carried the flute around for over a year, playing it in between scenes and learning how to play it before a director finally it occurred to him to actually have me play it in the series. It was just hanging on my shoulder. And then uh, I became kind of friendly with that guy, Michael Green, and one day he told me how you make them. And uh, so I decided I'm going to start making them, and I started making my own flutes. And then I actually started growing the bamboo. There was a stand of bamboo at Warner Brothers on the back lot. And I took a few sprouts and planted them on the other side of the pond. And when I came back uh, a few years later, there was a forest. And uh, this, this one here is a tree that I grew. And then I harvested it. and. Uh, cured it and, you know, made the flute and lacquered it. And uh, I used this uh, in the movie, The Silent Flute. I actually made it for the movie, and uh, which is in the United States called Circle of Iron. But it's still The Silent Flute, and this is The Silent Flute. Cam Ewan <laughs> came in when we were doing the, uh, the pilot uh, movie to demonstrate the praying mantis form. Um, and he stayed to double key Luke, who was playing the blind master Poe. Um, they put a beard on him, and he did all the jumping around and the, the stick fighting, all that stuff that you saw. You know, key Luke was, I think, uh, around 70 years old at the time. And we got very friendly, and then uh, he was helping me out with the, f the first fights that I did with, uh, um, with David Chow. And he became kind of one of David Chow's advisors a little bit. And he stayed on, uh, continued to double Key Luke, and uh, he doubled me a little bit uh, at the very first. And then, uh, oh, I don't know, a little ways in, uh, we just became very friendly. Cam was very young. He was, I think, 27 years old when we met. He had a lot of youthful energy, and, uh, and he was obviously a master. But more than that, we related to each other very directly. I was uh, 
I, what you call a health food nut. I took a lot of vitamins and herbs and, and followed uh, um, nutritional practices. And he was interested in that, and I started kind of what you might say instructing him in that sort of thing. And at the same time, he was starting to teach me martial arts. And um, it just happened very organically. He just became my teacher. It just happened. And then there was a point when obviously the show needed some changes. And I had been hearing from people out there. Now, you know, nobody else in the series would hear from people because they weren't recognized on the street. But people would walk to, up to me in the street and say something about the show. And one of the things that I was hearing all the time was somebody saying, you know, that's not really kung fu that you're doing. It's more like judo. Well, David Chow is a judo man. And it was with the advice of other people that he was bringing in kung fu, but there just simply didn't seem to be enough of it for some of the fans, some of the people who knew. And so I said, you know, we've got to make it more real. We have to make it more Kung Fu. And so uh, David Chow stepped down and Cam Ewan came in as the coordinator. Now, by that time, I was actually studying pretty formally with Cam. Um, he was, uh, I'd arranged for him to be on the set and work out with me. So it was a very natural thing for him to take over. But once he took over as the uh, coordinator, um, then, you know, I mean, I was just, uh, you know, I was with him all the time. And then when the series was finished, you know, I, I figured I probably would never have anything to do with martial arts again. Um, but one day, one Saturday morning, I was sitting on the beach in Malibu in front of my house, and I suddenly got this just huge desire to, to work out. And so I jumped in my car. I thought I'd get down to the Saturday class at Camus' place in uh, Torrance. And I didn't make it. I got in my car and I drove as fast as I could. I had a Ferrari, too. But uh, um, I arrived too late for the class, but I just went in and started working out anyway, started stretching. And Cam came walking by and he looked at me really surprised. He never expected to see me again. And then I just kind of stayed there. He gave me a key to the coon, and I moved into a little room in the back and slept on a cot and just worked out all day, talked to martial artists, uh, ate the health food that he was now, you know, he'd, he had a, a health food store right next to the coon. And I uh, did that for several months until I lost the key. He wouldn't give me another one. But then he started coming to my house uh, every morning at 9 o'clock and teaching me. And then uh, he started traveling with me on various locations. We went to the Cannes Film Festival together. And uh, uh, I did a picture with him in, in Germany, uh, directed by Ingmar Bergman. Ingmar was uh, very taken with what I did in between takes. And uh, I just kept developing, and well, I've obviously never given it up. Most of my work with Cam was, was not classes. I took a lot of classes with him, but most of my work was individual. And he was, as has always been his philosophy, uh, to, to let a student develop at his own rate, with, uh, using his own strengths and dealing with his own weaknesses rather than just a you know, a standard curriculum. And uh, he was pretty much uh, handing to me what I wanted and also what he thought I needed at a certain point. I remember there was this one point at which he said, I want to show you this one kick. It's called an old man's kick. And I went, why is he doing that? <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out that it was very useful because it, uh, it fit into one of the four characters that I did in The Silent Flute. I needed to be able to have different styles for each of these people. And, and it was playing the, the teacher, the blind master, uh, 
I used that, that tech, those techniques. And uh, it was a good idea. But uh, I remember there was a certain point at which I said, you know, uh, what about Tai Chi? And he said, oh, Tai Chi is boring. It's for old people and women. And then, oh, a couple of years later, he said, you know, I think I'm going to teach you the Tai Chi form. And uh, so he was evolving himself. Uh, you know, Cam was, you know, a really feisty guy, a uh, fighter, and could easily brought to anger. And he himself was evolving, and uh, the stuff was working on him. You know, I think one of the things about mastery is, is not getting angry at people and not getting in fights. Uh, I, it seems to me when, when, uh, <laughs> when the universe is unfolding itself in front of you and you're learning cosmic truths, uh, beating up people is probably something you should probably forget about. James Coburn and a screenwriter named Sterling Siliphant had been students of Bruce Lee. And the three of them had cooked up an idea for a movie. Uh, it was basically, I think, Bruce's idea, and Sterling wrote it. And Bruce and James Coburn were going to play the leading roles in it. And they tried for uh, years, I guess, to get this picture made unsuccessfully. And, uh, and then after Bruce had gone back to Hong Kong, and after he'd made Enter the Dragon, I think, uh, then they got a deal to make the picture. And Sterling Silifon's agent called up Bruce Lee in Hong Kong and said, guess what? We've got a deal for the silent flute. And not only that, but uh, they're offering you a million dollars to play the part. And Bruce, who by that time had become a little bit arrogant, said, do you realize what time it is here? and turn him down. So the picture was never made. So anyway, this friend of mine uh, stole the script out of James Coburn's library and brought it to me. And he said, you have to read this script, but you got to read it over the weekend. And I have to get it back in his library Monday, and nobody can know about it. And I went, all right, what's the secrecy? But OK. And I read the script. I said, my god, this movie has to be made. So I got in touch with Sterling Silphon and told him I wanted to make the movie. And I thought, somehow or another, I would get this movie produced. And Sterling Silphon's agent said, listen, we're just about to sell this script to a guy named Sandy Howard, who's going to make the movie. And don't you get in the way. I said, get in the way? Are you kidding? I'm not going to get in the way. I'm going to get the part. And I called up Sandy Howard. and. Uh, so anyway, the whole thing was put together, and we made the picture uh, without too many changes. There, uh, there was a rewrite, which I thought was kind of unnecessary, but uh, pretty much uh, it was the way that, that Bruce had conceived it and the way that Sterling had written it. And uh, I'm very proud of that movie. I love that picture. We shot that picture in 1977. And I was in incredible condition. I had been working out with Cam Ewan constantly and uh, for years now. And, uh, and he was the coordinator on the film. And we shot it in Israel. In, uh, in all of these historical places, these you know, pre-biblical locations, and, uh, and the biblical ones as well. And uh, just the entire experience was very mystical and very uh, deep. And uh, it made a pretty good movie. It has some flaws, but, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of money. Um, and uh, money does make pictures better if you apply it right. <laughs>